Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, in welcoming you, I'd first like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, on whose traditional lands we are gathered here this evening, and their elders past and present, the custodians of this land. So, good evening to you all, those of you who are here in Leighton Hall, and those who are watching us online as we live stream this event. I'd especially like to welcome our philanthropic donors and friends. Without their support, our research activities, innovative teaching, and this world-class campus would not be possible. It's wonderful to see so many of you here this evening, and it's worth reflecting that this free public event remains extremely popular uh, and it's evolved quite a lot over the last 10 years. It first started as a series of lunchtime lectures, but it is now UNSW Medicine's signature event, and we see it as a valuable way of introducing the medical research done in our facilities here and our most talented people to the wider community. Now, there's probably few people in the audience who aren't aware, either personally, through those close to them, or through colleagues, of the dilemma facing young women today around the issue of timing a family in the middle of a busy professional life. So this evening's lecture, The Ticking Clock, Demographic Change and Future Families, will address this and also showcase some of UNSW Medicine's recent research in the area of reproductive health. We are very proud of our position as global leaders in the development of safe and effective reproductive technology. And as I said, many of the people uh, on the campus here uh, were involved in the early stages of leading this development. So with that introduction, I'd now like to introduce our facilitator of this evening, Associate Professor Elizabeth Murphy. Elizabeth is an alumna, I've been told, uh, not an alumnus of UNSW, and she's an expert in early childhood whose work has made a real impact on children and families throughout New South Wales. She's overseen the implementation of a number of early intervention programs including statewide hearing and vision checks, personal health records, and Aboriginal maternal and infant health programs. She's currently Network Director of Child, Youth and Family Services for the Northern Sydney Local Health District and Senior Clinical Advisor to New South Wales Kids and Families. So Elizabeth, we are very privileged to have you join this event. Distinguished guests and seekers of knowledge. This evening I have the great pleasure of welcoming you and our world-renowned experts in the fields of social research and fertility to this extremely important Dean's Lecture Series. I would also like to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting today on Aboriginal land, the Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Thank you, Professor Smith, for your very kind introduction. And congratulations to you on an excellent um, Medicine Dean's Lecture Series, but especially on the choice of tonight's topic. Um, with what more important topic can there be than the one that we have today? The one that influences and even determines the next generation. The ticking clock, you've all seen that very powerful image for the talk tonight. A controversial title for this lecture, but the ticking clock can also remind us of the alarm. Hopefully, the outcome of this lecture, with the accurate information that the audience will receive, means that we can set our own clocks with no need for alarms. However, speaking of alarms, there is one very important housekeeping issue, so if you could please take your time now to check you don't have your alarm on your mobile phone um, and turn it to silent, that would be very gratefully received by the speakers. Um, thank you also to those of you who have already submitted some fabulous questions for tonight's Q&A session. 
Um, if you'd like to send in a question for our speakers via Facebook or Twitter, please use the hashtag, which is um, on the slide, and we'll be looking at them during this evening's um, lectures so that we'll be able to collect the further questions, and we look forward to having that Q&A session at the end of the evening. So in preparing for this evening, I went to my original handbook textbook of ONG and reflected on how things had changed a little in my clinical lifetime. I went to the chapter on infertility to see my very carefully underlined pages, remembering an era devoid of highlighters and sticky labels. Yes, students here today, there was a time when we underlined things that were important. And I carefully underlined the infertility section, and I need to repeat some of the important information that I received at that time. Uh, it refers to the statistic that 10%, and I quote exactly, of married couples fail to achieve a pregnancy between puberty and menopause. And 3% of couples will not have consummated their marriage. Now, I realise there are some people here, young people, who mightn't understand what that concept's about. So later on in the lecture, if you'd like to speak to someone more of my own age group, you'll be able to understand what that consummation was all about. Um, I emphasise this point with three exclamation marks. Now, we've obviously had an amazing technological revolution, and I have no doubt that one of those statistics would be very different. Um, just to reassure myself, I did Google today how to make a baby, don't do it lightly. There's, can I say, a little bit of information overload on that. However, I think a statistic that might have changed is expectations as to when conception is possible. The exceptional pregnancy is the high profile pregnancy and that leads to choices and decisions indeed that may be made by misinformation and false expectations. We hope to change that this, after, this evening. We're going to change the misinformation by empowering prospective parents, prospective grandparents and general population with accurate information on statistics and the science so that truly informed choices can be made on one of the most important decisions that we will make in our lifetime. My medical career has luckily been full of many privileges and none greater than being present at a birth. As a paediatric registrar, you're often called to births where there's a thought that the child might need some support or indeed resuscitation. And you never fail to be amazed and at the wonder of the first breath of new life. Conception, just as amazing, though I obviously haven't been as present as, as many conceptions as births, <laughs> but critically important, and, and how that has changed over the time, how the knowledge that we've changed. One of the most amazing facts is that once again when I trained, there was a ward full of children who had spina bifida. A water-soluble vitamin, vitamin B12, taken before pregnancy in the first weeks of pregnancy, closes spines and indeed has closed that ward. That's the power of the knowledge that we've found out about conception in a short time. Tonight we're going to learn and understand much more about conception and the science behind it. Just to conclude, um, one of the things I well remember is a lecturer on infertility, the additional to the wonderful text that I've called to, uh, mentioned earlier. And I'll never forget this lecturer said that if you told an infertile couple that if they walked naked down George Street that they would conceive, they would do that. That was such a, an amazing thought to me as a young medical student, but indeed as a doctor and someone who's worked in child health, I've seen parents do much more than walking down naked in a public street in their effort to conceive. It's something that we have got two very distinguished speakers to address this evening. Mark McCrindle will be speaking about the demographic and social change in relation to pregnancy, setting the scene for conception in the external environment. And Professor Bill Ledger will be taking us internally to the science of conception to assist us in understanding fertility. So our first speaker, Mark McCrindle, 
social researcher, demographer, author, is a psychology alumnus from this university. Through his work, he aims to help us understand the times in which we live. Through his private life, he gets first-hand experience. He and his wife, Ruth, have five children. So Mark well understands the life of compromise, perhaps, rather than the life of having it all, though having five children is having it all. Um, he reflects on the changing role of fathers um, when co-curricular, have you noticed there's no more extracurricular, it's all co-curricular? There was a time it was extra, no longer. And so indeed fathers have taken a much stronger role as has Mark in that role uh, with his own family. Tonight he's going to be talking to us about what's been happening, describing Gen Y, their experience, the extended adolescence. So could you please join me in welcoming Mark McCrindle to the stage. Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, thanks, Dean, for convening us all here this evening, and good evening to you. Well, it's uh, such an interesting topic in these interesting times. We are living in a decade which will probably prove to be the decade of the biggest change, probably in living memory, maybe even beyond that. We're in this decade that began in 2010, and we're halfway through it. It's going to take us through to 2020, which has always been that iconic year of the future, that iconic year of what's next, and within five years we will be there. If we were to sum up this era in which we're living with a single word, it would probably be that word change, because wherever we look, that's what we see, although what more accurately describes this decade in which we're right in the midst of at the moment is not just that sort of change, but probably that sort of change, because it's fast change and it's constant change, and. It's change that's permeating all areas of life. I was just, just thinking back to when the decade began in 2010, comparing that to today and what a lot of change we've seen. Generation Y, as this decade began, were still in their 20s at the oldest edge. They're, gonna, they're already now moving into their mid-30s, the peak fertility life stage right now for Generation Y. When we began this decade, the couple with children household was and still is the most numerous household in Australia, but by the time we complete this decade in 2020, the couple only household will be more numerous. We're in the midst of massive demographic change. We're in the midst of massive social and economic change as well. When this decade began, we had still some uncertain economic times, but the unemployment rate was at 5.1%. Now we're at 6.2%, and uh, the forecast is to hit 6.5%. By the, uh, by the end of this year. And so the economic uncertainties have an impact on families and the family planning as well. Uh, when we began this decade in 2010, we had the Aussie dollar had just hit parity with the US dollar for the first time since it was floated in 1983. So pretty strong economic times and now we're down to about 77 cents against the US at the moment. I was thinking about in individual lives, what change can take place in half a decade. Back in 2010, Prince William was still officially single and now he's married with two kids. So, you know, a lot can change in individual lives in half a decade. In, uh, in 2010, I, I was talking to my, I've got uh, two of my daughters in the tween years, I was just talking to them about pop culture and the like. They were telling me a little bit about One Direction that I'm not totally across, but I did look up that boy band and found that in 2010 they don't exist. And as of about a month ago, they don't exist once more, uh, which tells me that the life cycle of a boy band today is about five years as well. So a lot can change in five years. And, uh, and a lot more will have changed by the time this decade completes. In fact, if you, um, if you were talking about tablets back in 2010, before you know, these, the iPad had arrived in that year, uh, people thought you meant those sorts of things. And now, of course, when we talk tablets, we mean these sorts of things. Even our lexicon is changing, and that is having big impacts, of course, the technology and the expectations on this emerging generation. It's only occasionally in history that you get times like this, massive demographic shifts combined with rapid social change and huge generational transitions and ongoing technology trends, so much so that within the span of a decade, society altogether alters. And from a fertility and from a families and from a generation Y perspective, these are massive changes that we're seeing. And so to give a, a scan of the social landscape from a fertility, a generational and a, a, a family perspective, 
I thought we would use this as a little bit of navigation to look at some of these mega trends impacting families and children and fertility into the future. And the first would have to be the demographic changes, the shifts that we're seeing in that regard. Australia is undergoing quite a changing shape from a population profile perspective. If we go back three decades and look at our population profile, it used to be called the population pyramid because you had more younger people down the bottom than you had older people up the top. The clear pyramid shape is obvious. By the time we walk forward three decades to today, you start to get a sense of the changes and in three decades time, we will have lost any sense of the pyramid shape. In fact, by 2045, there will be more Australians aged over 60 than age under 20 for the first time in our history, this slowly inverting pyramid changes demographically because of birth rates and because we're living longer, because we're younger longer. It's of course a good news story, this aging of the population. But you can see apart from longevity rates, partly it has been created and driven through changes in the fertility rate as well. If we go back and we'll look over the last four decades, you see some significant changes in the fertility rate in Australia. Partly that comes about because of the changing life stages and life markers. If we go back just a generation, the average age or the, the life stage in which people were getting married was, well, it was a, an early to mid 20s something phenomenon. You can see it's pushed to the late 20s and early 30s today. And so it is with having children. In the span of a generation, it's moved from the mid 20s to the early 30s. In fact, even uh, the median age of a female at first birth is just shy of this. It's 29.3 years of age, edging ever closer to the 30 mark as well. So we're seeing demographic change. We're seeing social change. And this is transforming families and couples and children and the life stages into the future as well. If we think about the life markers and how it looked in the 20th century, it was fairly set and structured. You had childhood and then you had teenagehood and then you had adulthood, but that's not how it looks today. We're seeing changes to those life stages, more transition points, the emergence of the tweens, the eight to 12 year olds that are sort of like the teens of just a generation ago, up aging in a sense, older, younger. But if adolescence begins earlier, it certainly extends for later. We're seeing the markers that once defined adulthood, as we saw the marriage and the children, the mortgage and the career being pushed back uh, later amongst Generation Y today. And so the emergence of the young adult life stage. We've got a generation that are now staying at home longer, that are being educated later, that are pushing back their earning years longer in life than currently we saw. We've got a generation that knows that they're going to live longer. And in a sense, they're taking some of those retirement years and sprinkling them through their life earlier on. Work-life balance and uh, flexibility is the name of the game today. But it's impossible to take those fertility years and sprinkle them later in life as well. That's part of the challenge, I guess, and the expectation and indeed reality check. Uh, I guess by the time the mid-20s become late 20s, if we've still got young adults living at home, it's probably a stretch to still call them young adults, particularly as they edge ever closer to 30. But that's where the term KIPPERS comes into its own. It's an acronym, K-I-P-P-E-R-S. It just stands for Kids in Parents' Pockets Eroding Retirement Savings. <laughs> so do keep that in mind if you've got some KIPPERS in your household. And I can tell in the room we've got a few KIPPERS with us, and that's great to see as well. Uh, and of course, adulthood is a time of change and reinvention as well. Career changing and down aging and upskilling and transitioning. More life stages, more life markers, more transition points than we've ever seen before. And so with the transitioning life stages, we have changed fertility rates at different years. If we look at currently the age brackets, the, the leading fertility age, as you can see on this graph, it's those 30 to 34 years of age. That's where fertility peaks in Australia currently, that grey line up the top. Second to that are those in their late 20s. And those in their late 30s, 
the third line there, the yellow line, is well above those in their early 20s, the black line at the bottom. In fact, you can see the, the one line that has been trending consistently and hasn't yet dipped is the, uh, the line there, the 30 to 39 year olds, those in their late 30s. And so we've got changes in fertility and changes in the life stages. So demographic change and social change, and that comes around because of economic change. At least that's one of the uh, impacts that the economic changes has. If we think about leaving home and buying a home, if we think about nesting and planning for a family and thinking about owning a home, there are some affordability challenges today around achieving that Aussie dream. If you go back around four decades and look at median house price compared to average full-time earnings, we had a ratio of about five. Five times annual average earnings was about the cost of the average capital city house price. And certainly, along with rising house prices, have gone rising wages, but not at the same rate. In fact, two decades on from this point, now the average house price was six times average annual earnings. It was just harder to get a foothold in the property market. And today, you've got to take those $72,000 average full-time earnings and multiply 10 times to get that median capital city house price. In fact, here in Sydney, we're told that the median house price will probably crack the $1 million mark by the end of th this year, which will mean we'll be closer to 14 times the average annual earnings to get hold of that average city, uh, Sydney house price. That's the challenge that we have. And that means, therefore, that in the time that some of us were kicking around the campus here at UNSW to today, in real purchasing power terms, the cost of housing has doubled. And so it means that people are renting longer and renting later and moving houses more. And that, of course, has an impact on when people are starting families because you do have that social link, the need for stability or the desire for the nesting before the families start. We know that those who are renting in Australia, based on the Australian Bureau of Statistics data, are moving more frequently than ever. The average renter in Australia stays 1.8 years per home. And if you've got pe people renting later in life and longer in life, it means they're moving geographically more than ever has been the case. And with those moves, moving vocationally often as well. Those that buy a home have found the place uh, that they're getting a mortgage on. They're not staying 20 or 30 or 40 years in that home like our parents' generation did. You know, buy the home, start the family in the home, raise the kids in the home, and often we're still living as empty nesters in that home some decades later. The average Australian who buys a home stays in that home just eight years. This is the household with the mortgage moving across more housing stock, starting in the apartment. Maybe kids are coming along, so they're upgrading to the townhouse. Kids are growing up, so they'll move to a detached home or somewhere else. More churn, more change, more transition, living across more communities than ever we have seen before. Those that have paid off that mortgage have stayed longer in that home, but it means a lot more change than used to be the case. And so implications around when the couple are going to start the family. We've seen tenure in terms of job drop as well. The average national tenure, average across all age groups and all industries of an Australian in their job, is now three years. And if that plays out in the lifetime of a school or university graduate today, assuming that you know, they're getting their first job at around 18 or 19 and going to work through their 60s, which is the trend with longevity, it means that they will have 17 separate employers in their lifetime. They will work across five separate careers. They'll be working in jobs that don't currently exist, just as they're starting their jobs in roles that didn't exist when they began their education, perhaps app development or social media marketing or cyber security, new roles that have emerged in their educational time and new roles for their future as well. They'll live across 15 different homes based on those metrics. And so a lot of churn and change, more indeed than we've seen in the past. And I guess you know, one of the challenges, how do you get consistency and stability with this sort of change? There's a, a meme doing the rounds online at the moment, which sort of can show the impact of this change across jobs where you know, there's not the same experience or commitment to a role. And it's called, you only had one job meme and shows what happens when there's not that commitment on production lines. You can sometimes get the wrong items in the wrong packages and that can make it confusing for consumers. And I'm not sure what went wrong with the painting team that was putting safety messages on roads, but <laughs> something didn't quite work out. And there was a guy whose job was to paint the line down the side of the road, but uh, he didn't realise his job was to stop and remove fallen tree branches and that uh, wasn't a great outcome either. 
part of the downside of a time of change and churn and mobility. So demographic change and social change and economic change and of course generational change. The baton is being passed from one generation to the next in Australia at the moment. We've got the builders generation aptly labelled because they have been the builders of our communities, of our society, of our economies and institutions and of our way of life. But they were the generation starting their families in the early to mid 20s at the older edge and quite different to what we see today. And then the baby boomers came next and are our largest generation and uh, a key generation of influence. In fact, I thought we would, just as we're uh, commencing things uh, this evening, just get a little bit of interaction and see what generational mix we have here in the room. So firstly, if you are part of the aptly labelled generation of builders that have built so much in our community and society. Hands up if you're one of the builders generation. So good to see. Still here and building and contributing. Fantastic. What about the baby boomers? Hands up if you're in that baby boomer category. Good to see. And I hope we can just note those hands for a moment because the baby boomers are about a quarter of the population. They own more than half of Australia's national private wealth. So if we need a loan, uh, it's those ones that just raise their home hands, we can hit them up a little bit, particularly the next generation, Generation X, those of us in the 30s through the 40s turning 50 this year. Hands up if you're one of the Gen Xer cohorts and uh, I can see the slumped shoulders that defines the Gen X. It's, it's sort of uh, debt and dependence, that's sort of the life stage of us Gen Xers perhaps. Generation Y emerging in the 20s but hitting the mid 30s, hands up the Gen Ys right in the family forming age group and good numbers of Gen Ys with us as well. And Generation Z, the generation born since the mid to late 90s, hands up uh, any Gen Zs with us. We have a couple, that's good to see. Uh, obviously they're going to grow in numbers, not quite representative of their demographic share at the moment. Maybe a couple of them were there for the drinks and headed off, but that's, that's okay. They, uh, they, they really teach us a lot about work-life balance. I think that's, that's excellent to see. They've got places to go and people to see. Well, since the decade began, of course, we've got a whole new generation, Generation Alpha, born since 2010, the children of today. We are about to see the biggest intergenerational transfer that we have ever seen, the leadership transfer, the wealth transfer, and of course, from a life stage perspective, massive generational change as well. From the Xs who have been the parents to the Gen Ys and emerging Generation Z over this next decade will be starting their families as well. We're dealing with an increasingly educated generation. For the baby boomers, about one in five has a uni degree. For us, Gen X is about one in four. Currently, for Generation Y, about a third of them have a uni degree. In fact, if you take 25 to 34-year-old females, we're at 40%. And so edging ever closer to the halfway mark, and for Generation Z, it'll probably end up in their lifetime with about half of them with a university degree. So increased education, and again, delaying the earning years, delaying buying those homes, delaying the nesting, and delaying the family as well. Part of the, um, the opportunity, I think, for Generation Z is that they will be the bridge generation in this time of an aging population and these massive changes that this 21st century is bringing. Already we see Generation Z bridging gaps and bringing solutions to the changes that the future is presenting. I, I heard about a Generation Z fellow who had to go around and reprogram grandma's TV because she was pushing too many buttons on the remote control and he had to go around regularly, but he found a pretty good solution to the problem. Um, <laughs> He found that all he needed was a little bit of masking tape and uh, he could solve that once and for all. I think a generation that are innovative, not only the most formally educated, not only the most technologically savvy, but innovative as well. We're starting to see some changes with Generation Z. Uh, the pendulum in society generationally can swing from one to the next. Each generation is almost a reaction to the generation that went before. And with Generation Z, in our qualitative research, we're starting to see a change that they're not just going to further and further push back fertility. There is a return to some uh, of these approaches of old that you can't just have it all and all at the same time, but maybe some priorities and some planning in that regard are important. I guess the fifth and final change I would define these times by that are impacting the social trends and the family trends and the fertility trends, apart from the demographics and the economics, the social and the generational is the technological. 
and that is transforming so much of our society. In fact, Generation Z are defined here with so many of their labels that have technology embedded in them. Generation Connected, the Digital Integrators, the Dotcom Kids and the Screen Agers. It's a generation that has been transformed through technology. They are part of this great screen age. It's amazing to look at the screens and their ability to you know, be a few clicks away from any piece of information to transform their lives through the use of technology. These screens sometimes do something counterintuitive. We thought for a while they were getting smaller, but I found this guy picked up on a trend. Uh, they've started to get a little larger, which is a little strange, but Generation Z have been shaped wholly in this era where the screen time, hours per day in technological interaction, are greater than hours per day in face-to-face -face interaction. As Sigmund points out here, every year since 1997, basically every year in the lifetime of Generation Z, the average person has spent more hours per day through the screen interaction than that traditional social interaction. And so a generation, if we want to engage and communicate and connect, if we want to give them information and help them make decisions about their future and their families, fertility and planning their lives, then certainly through technology and through the power of the screen, we can influence and impact them. One impact we have seen of the screen age generation and technology that is shaping this future generation is through even the language that they speak. Slanguage, we call it, such as the texting language of today. And I thought I'd see how you would go understanding this generation. Here's a sentence that came my way from one of them. For she's my work gig is totes cron. The hours are deaths, cray cray but yolo. And uh, that's just sort of how they speak. It took me about half an hour on urbandictionary.com to decipher that. But uh, I've worked out that for shiz means for sure. And, and, and a work gig, well, that's just the job. And totes is totally and cron is chronic. If things sound bad, they're good. So he's happy about that. And uh, deaths is definitely and cray cray is just crazy. And yolo, well, you only live once. And so my, my interpretation of this, and. Sometimes it takes a little while to interpret these sentences. It takes a little while for them to state these sentences. But what this fellow was trying to say was quite simply, I like my job. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's just how they communicate. But if we are to guide and direct this generation, they do represent our future generation. We've got to understand them. We've got to communicate effectively with them. We've got to guide them through the channels, the mindsets and the attitudes that indeed define them. There are five characteristics I would use to define our future and emerging generation. This generation that'll hit the peak fertility years as 2020 arrives. They are global, globally influenced and the most culturally diverse generation our society has ever seen. Globally influenced through not just technology, but movies and TV, music and fashions, brands and food, a globally connected generation, a digital generation and the screens and the devices that they carry are the influence channels. For them, it's not just the experts, but the peer groups that guide their decisions. It's not just what the authority figures say, but it's what the social media will influence them on. It's a generation from a lifestyle perspective that are mobile and transitioning, and where they live and where they work will be more varied than ever before. And in addition to being global and digital and social and mobile, they are visual. It's the visual literacy, not just the written literacy that influenced them. One study I was looking at with Generation Z showed that the number one search engine for them in terms of total time searching for information online is no longer Google, but YouTube, because they don't want to read an article about something. They want to watch a video on something. That's how they are influenced and process information. Massive transformation in a short period of time. And so the future relies on us understanding the Gen Zs and effectively communicating and engaging with them. And that means being relevant and updating what we do and how we do and indeed how we communicate. I thought I'd conclude with a, a slide that, uh, or a photo that came my way. Uh, it's a message, a reminder that sometimes we need to adapt what we do and how we do it, how we communicate to be relevant to these times. In the US, they've had a, a safety message around waterways for some time. Uh, and this is the sign they've had. If you see someone drowning, it says, and in the middle, that is supposed to be a stick figure of someone with their arms raised saying, help, help, I'm drowning. But unfortunately, that's not how we read that in the 21st century. I mean, that's, that's lol. I mean, that's, that's LOL. That's, that's laugh out loud. And that is not the right response when someone is struggling in the water. It might have had relevance in the past. It's not relevant today. 
And I think for us to understand the future, drive the trends, for us not just to be impacted by the changes in this massive decade of change, but to understand the changes, to shape the trends, to impact the future. We have to understand the times. We've got to res <coughs> respond to the trends. We've got to understand the emerging generations and so hopefully and effectively communicate with them. And I wish you all the best in it. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Mark. That was just superb and wonderful for setting our scene before we move to the science. So our next speaker, Professor Bill Ledger, you all know is the internationally renowned fertility specialist and gynaecologist and head of the School of Women's and Children's Health and Professor of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. But when I am introducing a speaker, I like to find something else, something intensely personal and private that I can share with the 500 people in the audience, um, something else that they do. And um, unfortunately, Professor Ledger is someone who concentrates, works, is always thinking about work, but finally I found how he switches off. He chainsaws. <laughs> Luckily, it's not in Australia, it was when he was in England, it was a sustainable forest, but he kept the wood going for his family for 12 years in a sustainable forest environment. Now, I was very impressed having seen a little bit of chainsawing and knowing that it was quite complex and difficult, and asked him, how he went with that, and he explained to me that a surgical degree often helps with some of these things. So if you could please welcome Professor Ledger. So good evening and thank you all for coming. And I don't think Elizabeth meant that I was stitching my own hand back on after I'd chopped it off. But, uh, so uh, the organizers have, have nicknamed Mark and I Tigger and Eeyore. Um, and you have to guess which is which, but that's not going to be too hard. So, in 1547, Henry VIII died, possibly of syphilis, probably of complications of type 2 diabetes, definitely from extreme obesity, leaving the country in a bit of a mess because he'd invented the Protestant religion to sort out his marital issues, which, which only kings can do. And the succession went to his son, Charles VI, but he was a young man and he was sickly and he was unable to father an heir to the throne and he died after six years from tuberculosis. And so the succession went to the most tragic Queen of England, um, Jane Grey, who, who reigned for only nine days. She was deposed by the Catholic daughter of Henry VIII, Queen Mary. And Queen Mary came to the throne at 1553, and she had one job in life that she had to succeed in, and that was to have an heir to the throne. At that point in her life, she was 37 years of age. You see where this is going now. And she was desperate, so she married possibly a rather unsuitable young man, Philip of Spain, the son of Charles V, and they tried long and hard to make a baby. She had a pregnancy. Her period stopped, she became nauseated, her abdomen distended, and everybody waited with bated breath for the baby to be born and no baby. And after 10 months, people stopped waiting, the abdomen subsided, and she had what we call now a phantom pregnancy. Two years later, it happened again, another phantom pregnancy, and she never did manage to have an heir to the throne. She died in a flu epidemic, and the crown passed to her half-sister Elizabeth, and so the Protestant religion was restored in England. If only Mary had done an AMH test at the age of 30, <laughs> and been told she was in the lowest 25th percentile for AMH at age 30, and then gone on to freeze some eggs, maybe the whole history of the country in the north, and maybe our country here, might have been altered. So that's sort of by way of introduction, and I'd like to put before you tonight three key questions that I think define the talk I want to give. Why is it that women who still ovulate, who still menstruate, who are not in menopause, find it hard to have pregnancies and babies after the age of 40? Can we do anything about that, given the demographic trends that Mark has so beautifully illustrated? And if we can't, can we do something at least to preserve fertility to some degree 
most touchingly for young women who are facing chemotherapy or radiotherapy, which might be sterilizing to them, but, but also to allow the women of Generation Y who are confronted with a lot of challenges that us older people never were, to at least give themselves a few more years of having a chance to have a family, as well as to do well in life and raise the huge amounts of money to buy a house in Sydney, or a garage, or a hole in the ground in Sydney. That's the problem. On the right-hand side, you see a histological slide taken from a child who died at birth with the parent's permission, and it shows you that the whole of the ovary is just full of follicles of resting eggs, some of which will not ovulate until 50 years down the road from birth. But the process of attrition begins even before birth, and the clock in the title of our lecture tonight is ticking quite loudly right through childhood, through puberty, through adolescence. So at the age of 25, you already see the huge depletion in the number of resting follicles, resting eggs in the average person's ovary. And of course, when women get to the age of about 50, they run out of eggs, and that's menopause. We're not all the same. And one of the important messages that I try to get across to people in practice is that you, as a youngster, might have been blessed with more than average egg follicles when you were first being made. And so the attrition process will take longer to run through your fertile stock of eggs. Alternatively, you might have not been blessed and been born with fewer than average follicles at birth, and hence you're going to have your menopause at an earlier age, and you'll run out of fertility at an earlier age. And you can see the quite marked differences between Ms. Average and her sister, who's going to be fertile till 45, and her other sister, who might lose fertility at 30. And one thing that we've worked on over the years and is still active research in our group is this interesting hormone AMH, which is a blood test that we can now do for a few dollars that allows an individual person to see whether she's on the average line that we see here or whether, as an individual, she's got a greater or lesser store of eggs at any given age. That has relevance because if someone is below the line, and I've seen it many times, they might rethink their life plan. What seems to work is they take the, the report home, they leave it on the kitchen table, the partner comes home and he says, what's this all about? And suddenly she's got him because she can tell him about AMH and loss of eggs and we must get on with it. And if he's a man of any substance and he loves her, they'll go and make a baby naturally rather than needing to come and see people like us later for IVF. AMH, though, hurts. It can be bad news if you find yourself at the age of 30 down here in the bottom 10th percentile, and I use the analogy of Pandora's box, because if you do an AMH test, as some of my medical students did for a research project, and you find out that you're in the bottom 10th percentile as a youngster, that is truly life-changing, and decisions then need to be made which were not in that young person's vocabulary until she took the time to do the blood test. So, it's not so much getting a number, it's the interpretation of that number that taxes us all, and conceptualizing what it means is very important. We can make babies, or help make babies, for women who do not have any detectable AMH, but it's a hard thing to do. So herein lies the rub. In 1850, menopause didn't matter because hardly anybody lived long enough to experience it. The average age, the average length of life was, was only just a bit over 45 years, and, and similarly, fertility ran out at age 40, and, and that was not a problem for that generation. But, as you can see from the picture, now your daughter born today, hopefully not until we finish the lecture, will have a lifespan of nearly 90 years. But she will not have evolved in the sense of extending her fertile life to run in parallel with her life expectancy. Evolution is a very slow process. You might get the feel from the green line that evolution is happening. The age at menopause is slightly later now than it was 150 years ago. But evolution is not going to help us or our children or our children's children to reproduce later in life than their mothers or their grandmothers could do. Mark has alluded to the fact that this is on the background of a massive change in, in society and behavior for all the complex reasons that he explored, and I suspect one or two others that we don't even know about yet. 
So the top panel here shows you that in only 20 years, the average age of birth in Australia has moved from about 25 to over 30. And although there's some evidence that that process of shift is arresting, I mean, it has to. The average age of birth can't drift out to 50 in another 60 years' time. It's not reversing very much, if at all. The consequence of that is that the chance of a pregnancy or a live birth goes down, and the chance of a miscarriage, the chance of a child with a chromosome problem like Down syndrome goes up as women get older. And I'm criticised when I do talks like this because people say that's ageist and it's unfair. Well, it is unfair, but you can't beat biology. It is how we're made, and we can talk about it and explain it, but not much we can do can change it. Let me give you an illustration. This is time-lapse cine photography of embryos, a photograph taken once every seven minutes in the incubator, and these are human embryos. This one is dividing, it's, it's fertilized and is dividing into two cells, each with a nucleus, and you can watch it rather beautifully, I think, go from two to four to eight to 16 to 32, and eventually it will get up to blastocyst. This embryo comes from the egg of a 30-year-old woman. Let's have a look at what happens to the egg of a 40-year-old woman. There we go. Looks about the same to start with. The two pronuclei, the male and the female, are going to fuse. Two nuclei here. And when they fuse together, that's called syngamy, which is when the Catholic Church believes life begins. And now the, the embryo is beginning to divide. You'll notice here, this has gone right to blastocyst. That's how it should look on day five. This one is just starting to get going. And as soon as it divides, it starts to fall apart. And you'll see it's struggling to divide and grow as this one did so easily. But because this egg was 10 years older, the process is jumbled and much, much less likely to lead to an embryo that can create a baby than that beautiful blastocyst with the inner cell mass that makes the child and the trophectoderm that makes the placenta. And I think in a minute the embryologists switched this one off because they could see it wasn't going to go anywhere. That is really not capable of doing very much at all in the IVF lab. So some of our research, just a few highlights of what our group is doing, and I, I'm very proud of the people who work with me, and this is their achievement much more than mine. That's a human egg surrounded by cumulus cells, the cells that nurture and support and nourish the egg. And Rob Gilchrist, who's in the audience tonight with colleagues, is working on proteins that are made by the egg cell itself. BMP15, GDF9, we now believe that we can measure in the circulation. We can do a blood test to measure these proteins. I mentioned AMH. Well, that comes from the follicle around the ovary, but it's not a direct marker of the egg itself. And if we have direct markers, we might know more about egg quality, not just the number of eggs, which is what AMH tells you, but the ability of an individual, an individual person to make an embryo such as we saw on the left panel here rather than the right. Very early stage work, just getting going, but very exciting to be on the crest of that wave. And this is truly a world first if we can make this work, and it'll really put UNSW reproductive medicine on the map. A second topic is, so what? Why do eggs age? Well, the egg is a complicated structure. It has a skeleton that holds it in, in shape, and that can go wrong as it gets older. The mitochondria that give energy to the egg can break down and be less useful in terms of nurturing the egg, so that can go wrong. But the nucleus has to behave. The DNA has to divide to make the egg haploid, ready to get fertilized, and then the DNA has to be able to grow and divide and divide, as you saw in the little videos there. And my colleague Hayden Homer, also in the audience with his group, is looking at how the DNA divides. These little microtubules that sit there with the chromosomes organized in the spindle. And that is a spindle from the wool making industry, just to show you that it actually does look a little bit like a spindle. And this is work you, uh, on these compounds called sirtuins, that again, UNSW researchers spend a lot of time looking at aging and the role of sirtuins. Because this is the lovely spindle here with the chromosomes organized. And if you give a sirtuin inhibitor, I hasten to add this is in the mouse, not the human, what happens is that this process of organization breaks down. 
So sirtuins are intimately involved in the health of the egg, in allowing the DNA to be divided up properly and the new egg to form. And what excites me, again, in the mouse, this is from a 15-month-old mouse. It's a bit tough. That's like a 45-year-old woman. Mice don't live very long. And you can see how the division of the DNA, the chromosomes, is all disrupted here. And if you feed that mouse on a substance that promotes its sirtuins, that boosts its sirtuins, the spindle looks far more normal. So this is a dietary supplement that might allow mice to reproduce a bit longer. And of mice, of men, maybe in the future, we'll be able to have a fertility-promoting diet that will give women a few more years of reproductive health. But at the moment, we can't do that. But one of the big areas where science has moved forward is in freezing and storing eggs for the future. And this is a now bit of technology, not future. Egg freezing is quite straightforward. It's the first half of an IVF. You have the stimulation drugs for two weeks, no big side effects, quite straightforward to do. A brief anesthesia or sedation, collect the eggs, freeze them, and once they're frozen, they can be stored for, who knows, longer than it's yet been done. There's a child being born from a frozen egg 23 years after that egg was frozen, and that's not the biological limit of frozen eggs by any means. Critically, the egg is of the woman. It's her DNA. It doesn't require a male partner. So many of my young patients who are going to have chemotherapy, far too young to have a relationship in which they want to have children, can freeze eggs and then meet the man of their life later when the cancer's been cured. There's about 6,000 babies reported from frozen eggs. They seem absolutely fine, but they have an aversion to ice cream. Wow. Sorry, Mark. This hit the headlines last year because the big American corporations, Facebook and Apple and now Google, are offering their employees serious money to allow them to freeze eggs, to keep them working in the corporation for longer. Many of these women don't want to stop working in young age to have children. They want to keep going up career ladder and have their kids later. This has been criticized as putting unnecessary pressure on women, which I can, I can understand. But at least it's an option. And we're thinking in Australia this may start to happen along the lines as it's doing in America. The important thing, though, is does it work? Well, I just pulled a few studies out, and you can see that whereabouts in the world you are, survival rate of eggs when you thaw them, the chance of fertilization, and in some studies, the, the pregnancy rate is actually quite good. But one thing all of this science has in common is that the reports all come from eggs that were frozen when the woman was under 35. And that's the kick. Because most people under 35 still think they will find the man of their life and have a child naturally. And they come to see us when they're closer to 40 or older, when they realize it's a bit tougher than they thought it was going to be, and they want to talk about freezing eggs. The statistic, and you have to think this through a little bit, and it's very much a back of the envelope calculation, but the statistic is that the number of eggs you'd have to freeze to have a 50-50 chance of at least one child later at the age of 35 is about 12 eggs. At the age of 40 or over, it's more than 120 eggs. And one egg freezing cycle at the age of 40 might give you maybe six or eight eggs. So it's impractical and actually probably impossible to do much with someone who chooses to freeze her eggs much over the age of 40. And most of us don't advise egg freezing for women under, sort of over 38, under 39. So biology, again, is quite a cruel mistress here. It is an amazing area of work to be able to be part of. And again, I have some very good colleagues from the world of children's and adolescent oncology in this audience. And when you see people like this young woman, this couple who froze their embryos before she had a chemotherapy and then had two children from those frozen embryos 12 years later, that's pretty amazing. And I know from talking to many young people with cancer that what they want to have more than anything else in life is to go back to normality, to grow up, fall in love, have their family, and the children are the most important target they set. And having frozen eggs or embryos during the dark days of chemotherapy is a great support to them. So it's a privilege to be able to help with that. And my good friend and colleague Antoinette Anazodo, again UNSW and Sydney Children's Hospital, and, and our colleagues have set up the Future Fertility Study, which is a massive registry looking at the whole of Australia, New Zealand, the west coast of the United States, logging every new cancer patient diagnosed under the age of 40 to follow them. 
Who has children and who doesn't? Who freezes eggs and embryos and who doesn't? Why did they freeze them and what did they get from it? Looking at the health economics, the psychology, and most importantly, the likelihood of having a baby from these clever technologies applied across the whole population of our country. And that's a very long-term project, but we think it will give some very interesting results when it's complete. The final piece of science I want to throw at you is in some ways the toughest to get, and this is Tristan Hardy, a PhD student with us, and the very well-supported Garvin Institute that does some of the best next-generation sequencing of DNA in the world. One project we're trying to do here is to look at eggs from young women with cancer before we freeze them, because at least 10% will have an inherited cancer gene. And there's not much point in freezing an egg if it's got BRCA, as Angelina Jolie has, or one of these cancer genes that we really don't want to perpetuate into the next generation. So we've just been able to get funding for a laser that allows us to cut a hole in the shell of the egg and take out the polar body, which we can examine without damaging the egg itself. And by doing next generation sequencing, we can tell whether each egg will have DNA that is a cancer gene or not and hence only freeze the ones that are healthy. There are other things that people can do, and I just wanted to touch on the topic of egg donation. Egg donation works if you have a donor who's young, under 35, even if you have a uterus which is 70 years of age, it can carry a, a pregnancy and give birth to a child. Whether it's right or proper for a 70-year-old woman to give birth to a newborn baby is a question I think we'd need to answer, and it's not something that we would do in Australia. But younger people like Sonia Kruger, who's one of my particular heroines in this, because she was honest and said at the age of 49, my child is from donor egg. That's how the movie stars and the TV stars do it. The problem is they're usually quite private, unlike Sonia, and so people come to see me saying, oh, I can have a baby at 45 or 46 from IVF because this film star or TV star did it, and you can't. It isn't going to work unless you have a donated egg from a younger person, and accept the fact that that child will not be of your own DNA. Big decisions to take, a lot of counselling, a lot of thought before donor egg is resorted to. So to finish up then, what are the next steps? Well, one of the reasons that we put this program together this evening is to talk about the plan for a center of research and clinical excellence at the Royal Hospital for Women, where I do my clinical work, and UNSW, a center for reproductive medicine and biology. And it has a number of goals, one of which is to work hard to perfect and improve the process of freezing eggs, embryos, ovarian tissue, and sperm, for young people with cancer. It's a bit hit and miss at the moment. We're not bad at what we do, but we could be a lot better and some good science and technology needs to be applied there. We think we have some good ideas about how we can improve the outcome from IVF. New science, which needs to be translated out of the research lab into clinical trials with real people. And that's a hard thing to do, persuading women who want to have children and their partners to participate in research. So it needs a big effort to get clinical studies going. We'd like to try and do that. We want to research holistically. We want to look at the psychosocial and costs and the effect on the whole person of infertility, of fertility treatment, of good outcome and bad outcome. And that, again, is an area that needs more study, looking at the whole person and the whole relationship, the whole couple, rather than just a fertility problem and a pregnancy test is the answer. And then I'm the first to admit there's not a great evidence base for a lot of what we do. We don't have the resources that cancer and heart disease and neuromedicine have, and we should challenge some of the non-evidence-based practices that run so deeply through what I do and what my colleagues do a lot of agents that people spend a lot of money and time and effort on just simply don't work, but they are a bit gullible because they're desperate and they go along with suggestions off the internet of all these things that, that can help. So here's the position at the moment. We have Prince of Wales Hospital, Sydney Children's Hospital, Royal Hospital of Women, general practice and all sorts of other referral pathways coming into our oncology system and our fertility clinics in a rather ad, um, ad hoc and jumbled up way those patients will somehow get into a process of consultation and counselling. They might need clinical IVF, and we would like to research on them, but we can't often access them. So if we had to put all of that in one box, a building, a place, with the research scientists, with the counsellors, with the doctors and nurses who do this every day, with a clinical IVF facility that is research-focused, 
the patients who come, we can't make them, but we'd ask them to participate in clinical trials, ethically approved and safe and proper, but that can push that knowledge forward. And you can see the kind of areas we think are quite sexy at the moment in the world of ART. I'll not go through them all, but particularly the genetics is very, very interesting and novel. Particularly the effect of being a good embryo on your health as a child and an adult. That really needs a lot of work and development. It's the Barker hypothesis that if you have a good pregnancy and you're a big baby, you live longer. That's only half the battle. It's what you were like as an embryo. What happened to you in the first three or four weeks? What happened to you before mom even knew she was pregnant that can determine the effects as an adult? Although my mom smoked, smoked 40 cigarettes a day, so just think what I could have done if she hadn't. It would have been amazing. So, so uh, some things for discussion, some ideas for the future, a concept of how we as a group are moving forward and hopefully can, can deliver something really spectacular for the next generation and help them solve some of the problems that Mark has outlined. So thank you very much. And thank you for the wonderful questions that we've received as the uh, two excellent speakers have been presenting their lecture. Um, I think one of them, I don't know if you saw, there was an opinion piece by Professor Ledger in the Sydney Morning Herald today, and it's been creating lots of um, interest and commentary. And I suppose a lot of it is, and I'll, I'll address this to both of you, about are we putting even more pressure on women with regard to giving them information about fertility, um, especially with what you were talking about, Mark, with regard to housing and its affordability. So our question is around that and about what about the mental readiness of both partners? Uh, are people going to rush into becoming parents um, mm. as a result of this information? So, for both of you. I think I've got this. Well, oh, okay. I think uh, that it needs to be a, a wider societal conversation. It's not just you know, a focus or ought not be just pressure on women. It's obviously a conversation for men. It's a conversation for society because so many of the influences and the drivers are societal issues, as we've said, from the economic to the, to the social, uh, the technological and, uh, and, and intergenerational. So, so, yeah, I think it ought not be, you know, have this sense or tone that it's, that it's women to, uh, alone who have to bear the pressure or you know, take, the, take the focus. Yeah, I agree. I think it's an issue for couples. We've done some research and we know that young men are, feel it's as important to them to be a dad as young women do to be a mom. So it's not something that's focused entirely on the woman, although one of the unfairnesses in biology is that men have a lot longer to reproduce than women do, and, and that's just the way it is, and, we, and that's not in any way being critical. Um, we live in an, a society where availability of information is enormously more than ever before. A lot of that information, sadly, is inaccurate. People are misled by the movie stars having kids at 50 and not confessing it's a donor egg baby. So all we're trying to do is to put the facts in front of people. I know it can be pressurizing, but that's part of modern life. There are more choices, more options to, to, to follow. And to me, the saddest thing is when somebody comes to see me at 44 with a partner, deeply in love, wanting a child who just didn't get that that was pushing biology further than it was likely to give. And if we can avoid that tragedy by people coming in their 30s to have children, I think it's probably worth that pressure and that criticism. What advice would you have given your mother? Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> if we broadened it. it. Yes. <laughs> um, what advice would you give a young woman yes. planning for pregnancy? Two years ago, I was telephoned by a friend who does my job in Adelaide. And he says to me, we're having a, a public meeting, a bit like this evening, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the birth of the first IVF child in South Australia. And would I go and do the plenary talk? And he says, and Bill, I want you to be controversial. Well, I'm never controversial. I'm so mainstream. But I thought on the plane on the way down, how am I going to handle this? So I stood up in front of this big meeting with the premier of the state and journalism and all this. And I said, if I was the father of daughters, because I, I only have sons, and it was my daughter's 30th birthday. She would probably be on her second PhD. She would have had a few friends and relations, but wouldn't be nowhere near ready to be a mom. So for my daughter's 30th birthday, I would buy her a cycle of egg freezing. 
And that's what the audience did. And when you're a speaker on a podium, you know you've got them when they make that sort of <gasps> reaction. And that's the advice I would give, that, that hopefully by the age of 30, you will be in love with the man who is going to be your life partner, as we were, and as I suspect you were. And if that's the blessing you have, just get on with it. But if that's gone wrong, if your relationship has broken down, or maybe you haven't had the right relationship and you're getting over 30, have your AMH measured, have it interpreted by someone who knows what they're talking about, and then if necessary, think about freezing eggs because it just stretches out the opportunity to be a parent with your own eggs, not donor egg, for a little bit longer. Most people I know who do that never use them, but that's not a bad thing. It's about options rather than about necessity, and I think there's a wisdom in that for that group of people. And for everyone else? And for? <laughs> the general, general advice with regard to pregnancy. Oh, well, the main thing is... Preconception advice. Okay, the main thing is plan your pregnancy. We plan mm -hmm. everything these days. Even now, half of the pregnancies in Australia are unplanned and good on them. I think that's a great thing, actually. <laughs> but for those who, like most people here, are a little bit more organised, the basics of planning pregnancy, mm -hmm. checking that your pap smear is up to date, that your rubella are immune, that you've had the necessary blood tests, that you've done some genetic screening these days because a whole panoply of more modern tests are available. Check to see that you're not a carrier for cystic fibrosis or fragile X or one of the other inherited diseases that can blight lives if your partner is also a carrier and together you create a child that has a really nasty life shortening and really ha unpleasant life because they have one of these conditions. The Jewish community in Sydney know it well because of Tay-Sachs disease in the Ashkenazi Jewish community. They check the, the Mediterranean people often check because they know they have thalassemia genes, but different genetic conditions apply to every racial group. And I think if you are planning pregnancy these days, it's not too difficult to be cautious and make sure that if your partner and you both do carry a recessive condition, come and do PGD and we'll make sure that your embryo is not affected by it. Mark, this is a question for you that we've been asked, which is probably a little difficult, but is there any research to support an optimal age for parenthood? <laughs> no, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's individual and very varied. I mean, certainly nothing that I know. Uh, no one's ready, no one's ever prepared, no one's got enough money, you know, otherwise the world would be childless if we all waited till we were perfect and ready and, and organised. Um, so, so I don't think there is, but I, I think this, what Bill's discussing in terms of the realities of the biological uh, world are important. It's important information that we get out there because we do live in an era where we've got a generation that, as someone said in a focus group I was running once, I said, what do you do if you make a bad choice or a bad decision in life? He said, it's easy, you just hit the undo button. And there's this idea that if things go wrong, there'll be a solution. The undo button might be the doctor, might be the medical profession, science and technology. But as we know, and as has been clearly demonstrated, there are some limits. We call it the safety net syndrome, that we've got a generation that's grown up with a bit of a safety net. And, uh, and that safety net can catch you if you don't make the right choices or things aren't working out or you delay things too late. There's a safety net that can sort it out. But as Bill has made clear, that safety net syndrome is not actually a reality. There's not always a safety net there. So I think if people have the information, they can make more of an informed choice at the right age. But on that, just with regard yeah. to fertility, you mentioned a little bit of information coming out with regard to diets. Yeah. Is there any other information with regard to any other alternative therapies that is evidence-based at this point in time? Oh, the basics are true. I mean. Try not to smoke cigarettes if, you, if you're trying to conceive a child. Try to keep your alcohol intake and intake of other drugs down to a minimum or not at all. I'm a co-author of a big Cochrane review on acupuncture and fertility, and we spent a lot of time with two Chinese doctors who were acupuncture experts looking for evidence that that works in terms of, of helping embryo implantation or pregnancy. We couldn't find anything. The same applies to most of the alternative therapies that are out there. I'm not overly critical because they help people. They help them cope with their problem, they reduce stress, they relax, and they're supportive. And I work with people in alternative medicine, but I think if it's a claim that we can improve pregnancy rates by taking this vitamin or nutrient, I'm very skeptical. And I think it can offer false hope to people. So although we're holistic and we try and do medicine with everyone who wants to help, the evidence that these things work, I'm afraid, isn't really there. 
That covers a lot of the questions that we received, so thank you very much. Um, for a final concluding comment, I'd like to ask each of our speakers, because um, all of you, I think, have a responsibility because we've received some really important information tonight as ambassadors of this information so that people are much more informed. So I'm going to ask each of our speakers if there was only one thing that was said at a dinner party tomorrow night, repeating what you said tonight that you thought, yep, that was great, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, I think at least one application from what I was discussing is that we need to encourage uh, the emerging generation of, of young people to be futurists in terms of thinking about their future. I, I see there is a futurist association there sending out information about their conferences and I, uh, I think that if they're feeling a futurist it should just say conferences coming up, you know where and you know when and just sort of see who turns up. So I don't mean that sort of futurist but thinking about one's own future and plans and it is hard to, you know, when someone's in their 20s or hitting 30 to think about about what the future might hold, but if we if we can get people to think a little bit about that and prepare for their future options, that's great. We did a lot of work with young people looking at superannuation. There's another area where, hey, it's a couple of lifetimes away. I'm in my early 20s. Why would I care about saving for the future? Well, the future will arrive, and if they've planned for that future with some superannuation, they'll be glad. Uh, I remember in a focus group I was running on this, and um, and and a guy 20 years of age, and not thinking at all about retirement, he said, "Look, mate, as we were discussing superannuation, he said, it's not that we don't care on purpose. He said, it's just that we don't care." And, and I think that's, that's, that's part of the problem. So somehow to make people care about their own future needs, their future self, when they're at a point where they don't care because they're young and free, that's I think the challenge we face. Thank you. <laughs> well, to follow that with brevity, if not clarity, um, sex is more fun than IVF. <laughs> and it's a lot but cheaper. That, but <laughs> Well, at least for most of us, anyway. But is that after the entree, before the main? Um... Oh, that's with the dessert wine. But, 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 <laughs> but, but my serious point there is, honestly, if you want one message to take home, to encourage your, your friends, your family, do it the way mum and dad did and grandma and granddad, which is just settle down young enough to have those fertile years as a couple to give you the chance to have children, because... What I know from my own life, what I know Mark does from his, is that they're your next generation. They're, the, they're what matters when you get older, much more than having three cars and two houses and lots of money in the bank. So don't miss out on the best stuff in life because the pressures of life are immense and we all want to do well. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Tonight we've gone from statistical to scientific to spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> the spirit of humanity and what we need to do in supporting our next generation. I'd like to conclude by thanking our amazing speakers this evening. Um, if you could to do that in the traditional way with a show of hands. Okay. <laughs> it worked really well. And if I could invite Professor Peter Smith to come to the stage to conclude this very important series. In closing, I just want to emphasise that the work of Bill Ledger and his colleagues at the School of Women's and Children's Health promises to make a real impact upon the community. I think you've heard that discussed at some length here tonight. It will see improved success rates and new discoveries that will lead to better understandings and treatments in the area of fertility and our understanding of issues that we've discussed tonight. You may find, you'll see there's a flyer on your seat and we're in, currently in the process, as Bill explained, of establishing a new centre at the Royal Children's Hospital for Women which will bring together experts in reproductive medicine, cancer specialists and scientists who will revolutionise the way that IVF is delivered in Australia and any support, any gift that you can offer to this cause will be very gratefully accepted and appreciated. So in closing, I hope you've all enjoyed this 2015 Dean's Lecture and I'd like to thank our speakers for their time.
I'd also like to thank uh, my staff in UNSW Medicine who've made this event this evening possible. I'd like to thank Trisha O'Brien and I'd like especially to thank Christina Kennett, who really was a person who uh, did a huge amount of work in, in pulling this together for the evening. So again, I'd like to thank her and her team. Now, this is my last Dean's Lecture. I will be retiring as Dean of Medicine at the University at the end of the month. So with, it's with some sadness that I thank you all for your support over the last 10 years and to thank you uh, through that support for the evolution of this, as I said, from something that was a sort of lunchtime series to this major event that we hold a couple of times a year. So as part of that theme, I do want to uh, look forward to welcoming our new Dean, Professor Rodney Phillips. He'll be joining us from Oxford University at the end of this month. So thank you everyone for attending and good night. <laughs>